Oh, great. Great, great. And let me see. I'm going to, to try to share my screen. Is that working? Great. Great, great. Um, so, hi, I'm Jess. I run Sexual Health Innovations. And today I'm going to be talking about Callisto, a online sexual assault reporting system that we've built out for college campuses. So Sexual Health Innovations, uh, we're a nonprofit, small, based in San Francisco, and our mission is to create technology that advances sexual health and well-being in the United States. And when we first incorporated, we were working a lot around STDs, around partner notification, test result delivery, but for the past few years, we've been focusing on the issue of college sexual assault. Now, just to give a bit of an overview of the problem of campus sexual assault in the U.S., it's estimated that one in five women and one in 13 men will be sexually assaulted by the time they leave college here. Uh, and of those assaults, less than 10% are reported. The reporting rate in the general population is estimated to be around a third, but uh, on college campuses, it's significantly lower in part because people are very likely to know the person who assaulted them. And the better they know the perpetrator, the less likely they are to report it. And when survivors do report, on average, on college, they wait 11 months before they make that report. Now, this delay contributes to the fact that among those who do report, um, only 6% end up seeing their, their rapist spend a single day in prison. There are a lot of different factors that are happening here. Um, but the lack of sort of uh, quick reporting, high quality evidence, um, other than the survivor's own testimony, and uh, survivor dropout once they start to get into the process post-report are some of the contributing factors to this really low rate of um, justice following a report. Overall, this means that about 99% of rapists get away with it, um, with the underreporting and the lack of justice following a report. So we're really operating in a society where there basically is no real deterrent to sexual assault uh, in general, and certainly not on college campuses where you see even lower reporting rates. There are a lot of different reasons why survivors um, don't report in the first place and why following a report, they might not want to take it all the way to a criminal proceeding. Uh, those include lack of information about the reporting process. Often people aren't quite sure where to go, what to expect once they get, get there. That's particularly true for young people who are maybe concerned about their parents finding out, um, concerned about confidentiality. And then when survivors are in the process post a report, they're often thrown into this system that they don't necessarily feel like they understand. They don't feel empowered to navigate. And it can be really, re really re-traumatizing because they feel like they're losing control all over again. Uh, they're worried that they won't be believed. They are often not sure if it's serious enough to report. Often campus assault doesn't involve violent assault and it doesn't involve stranger assault. And uh, we as a society don't often have great com conversations about what sexual assault means when it's with somebody who you know or when it's not violent. There is a lot of fear of retaliation by the offender or losing one's social network. Uh, and the, lastly, and this is one that isn't talked about a lot, but we see a lot of survivors struggling with really not really knowing why the assailant did it. And knowing why the person assaulted you did it can be a really big factor when you're trying to decide whether or not to report. Trying to figure out, is this somebody who made a damn mistake or maybe it was a misunderstanding versus was this somebody who knew that I wasn't consenting and did it anyway? And this particularly comes into play um, given that about 90% of assaults are committed by repeat offenders. And, but as a survivor, you don't really have a great way of knowing, did the person who assault me just do it once, or is this a larger pattern of behavior? And when we talk to survivors, uh, the vast majority of them would be interested in reporting if they knew it was a pattern of behavior. And when we talk to those who have reported, one of their main motivators was knowing or suspecting that they weren't the only one that this had happened to. Um, so we created Callisto, which is an online sexual assault reporting system to sort of help address these challenges and try to figure out how can we reimagine this reporting process, which right now is really daunting and rarely results in justice, and try to make it something that if a survivor decided to engage in it would actually be empowering and would help them sort of reclaim control of their lives uh, and would also help sort of protect our communities from uh, potential threats. 
And there are four basic components to the website. The first is just clearly written information about reporting options, what happens if you go to your school versus the police, what to expect, what definitions are used. The second is the ability to electronically report rather than having to go in in person and be across the table from somebody who may or may not believe you, just be able to push a button, send it in uh, with your identity. Uh, the third is being able to create a time-stamped record of what happened to you. So even if you don't want to report yet, you can still save and preserve evidence uh, that you're under no obligation to ever share with anyone. Uh, and lastly, we, we have a sort of unique program called Matching, where you can decide to opt in and report only if somebody else names the same perpetrator. In that case, what would happen is if one survivor went in, saved his or her record, and then another survivor came in a few months later and named the same perpetrator, the verified contact information of both survivors would be sent to the authorities at the same time, and the survivors would get a notification that there had been a match. Uh, and at that point, they could decide whether or not to share the full details of what happened to them with the authorities. So what it actually looks like, here's the homepage. Uh, it sort of provides information. We start with write it down, which is creating that timestamp document. But you can also explore reporting options, get support. We try to provide linkage to local resources and learn sort of about how it works. If a survivor decides to start creating that timestamp record, we ask them a series of questions about what happened to them. And we really try to track with the best practices around trauma-informed interviewing techniques. What questions do you ask? In what way? How do you build that sense of safety for someone while they're filling out a form, similar to, try to, to how you would try to build a sense of safety with someone in person if you were a um, highly compassionate police officer who is doing this interview yourself? So we ask about, for example, how recent was it, uh, multiple choice. If somebody says that it was within the last five days, we flag to them that you might want to go get a forensic exam and where to find one near you. Uh, but for most people, it will have been longer than that, in which case we wouldn't show them that information, and we just go on to asking more specific information about when it occurred, and then from there, diving into greater detail about where it happened, and using a mix of sort of multiple choice and free response questions so that people can ask as little or as much as they feel comfortable with. For example, on the multiple choice, they can always say, I'd rather not say, if for whatever reason... Um, they don't want to record a, a specific detail. Following the completion of this record, where they go through and document sort of the questions that are commonly asked of survivors, they encrypt everything they just wrote with a secret passphrase. And this is really important for data security purposes, as well as worrying about subpoenas and warrants. Uh, we don't have this passphrase. The user has this passphrase. Everything's encrypted with it so that even we can't view what they wrote. And um, the downside is if they lose their passphrase, they lose their record. But the upside is this information will never be released without their consent. Following the creation of this record, they can either electronically report it to their school. Um, we have been talking to police and district attorneys about integration with the criminal justice system, but that it hasn't happened yet. Uh, or they can opt into the matching system. If they decide to do any of these two actions, they have to verify their identity with their campus email address, uh, state their preferred contact information, and then uh, in the event of matching, provide a unique identifier for their assailant. Uh, we actually use Facebook email, Facebook username as our unique identifiers, but you could also use something like a cell phone number, a campus email address, anything that's unique to an individual and that a survivor is likely to be able to find about their perpetrator, provided that they know who they are. We launched in August on two college campuses in California. And uh, what's next for us is really expanding Callisto to other schools, um, improving Callisto based on user feedback, making the flow a little bit in more intuitive, redoing that home page, making it a little bit easier to access the matching system, and exploring other applications for Callisto. The same type of system could be used in the military, but you could also see something like this being used for, say, sexual harassment in this, the workplace where you have the same barriers of people not necessarily wanting to come forward unless they know they are not alone, a lot of confusion around what happens if I do report, and um, a lot of lack of protections or availability for people to be able to store information without taking action on it. And our theory of change is roughly, if, if this is the way the world is now, can we uh, increase the number of reports? Can we increase the action that happens when those reports 
um, come in? And can we start to prevent assaults by particularly identifying repeat perpetrators? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, 90% of assaults are committed by repeat perpetrators. But if you were able to stop those repeat perpetrators after even their just their second assault following a match, you could prevent 59% of sexual assaults from ever occurring just by halting those repeat perpetrators, that sort of long tail, earlier on. Uh, and our, our hope, hope down the road would be because we're actually creating a deterrent for assault for maybe the first time, um, maybe people wouldn't even try to assault anyone in the first place, which was obviously the world that all of us hope to exist. Uh, but that when, if that does occur, that survivors are appropriately supported. That is the overview.